Hello and welcome to uh, 19 hours um, of covering two of the best celestial events of 2020. So uh, if you've never been here before, uh, this is a slew star party and tonight it's a shooting star party, I guess. Uh, so tonight we are celebrating what I consider to be the best meteor shower um, of the year, of the entire year, the Geminid meteor shower. And peculiarly, those of you who uh, kind of check out a lot of slew meteor shower shows, you'll know that we normally do them a lot later. But the peculiar thing about the, uh, the Geminids is that we can see them before midnight, which is pretty cool. It's pretty cool because it means that we can have an early night tonight. We're going to have an hour and a half of meteor watching now, but then we can catch a little bit of sleep before the biggest celestial event of 2020, the great South American total solar eclipse. Now, that is tomorrow, Monday. That's 9.30 a.m. Eastern time, uh, 2.30 p.m. GMT. Um, so that is certainly one not to be missed. This one, what we're seeing here um, is a huge swathe of the night sky. Now, what you'll what you'll notice here, Mike, you can you can tell us because you know this when you go to a, one of the world's best observatory sites, which is the Canary Islands, um, the stars don't twinkle. Why not? So this is a live well, video feed. It's not a static image. It's a live video feed. Why aren't the stars twinkling like they do when if I go out to my own backyard? Well, great, uh, great question. And it is one of those things that really is striking is how and because of that lack of twinkling, they just appear so close. And it has everything to do with the nature of the atmosphere. And it's the air of you know, Earth's air that the light from the stars has to pass through. Because what is twinkling in the first place? Well, you know, especially when stars are very close to the horizon, they have to pass through so much of the Earth's atmosphere, just like the setting or rising sun or the setting or rising moon. And as they pass through the Earth's atmosphere, the uh, the different layers of the Earth's atmosphere cause the, there's a beautiful shot of Orion, uh, causes oh, yeah. the um, light from the stars to disperse and to separate into their different colors, basically just like a water droplet with a rainbow. And, um, you know, that twinkling, especially with a bright star like Sirius, which is, of course, is a, the, one of the bright, is the brightest star, is this, and was visible, I think, a moment ago, is um, is just, it's magnificent. Oh, <gasps> did you see that? Okay. <laughs> it, it was worth waiting for. There, there you go. go. I hope someone was snapping for that one. That was a keeper. Wow. Yeah. It was. Goodness me. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, Mike. I, um, that That uh, is yeah. one of the problems with meteor showers, when they are yeah. in full flow on one of our star parties that you'll lose your train of thought because something like that happens. Um, <laughs> I'm going to ask you um, about the color of that in a second. So, yes. uh, but carry on, carry on. Yeah, yeah no, it was, uh, it's just like that. Uh, there's a movie where there's a squirrel type of a distraction. And, <laughs> but you know, the twinkling, so the reason that so the observatories are generally placed at high altitudes, you know, 10,000 feet, let's say, uh, 3,000 meters, 4,000 meters, something like that. And the reason for that is just to get above the Earth's atmosphere. And any time we've been to a high altitude and a, a mountain, maybe a ski, or there's some sort of a high altitude event, you can look down and you can see how hazy everything is below you. And that's great for astronomy because you don't have to look through all that haze uh, as you're, uh, as you're, uh, as you're, uh, as you're doing your observing. So the that haze is what really causes the twinkling that Paul was asking about. And so what, uh, at an observatory, you, you don't want that. You want everything to be very still and stable as best you can. And that's why uh, observatories tend to be at very high altitudes or even in space where there's zero twinkling yep. because, of course, there's no atmosphere. Now, Mike, uh, the region. Oh, it's just saw a little one down. Oh, and another. That was two Missed down it. at the bottom. Missed. Oh, oh I just saw it. There we go. Yeah, I just saw one. Wow. Now, oh. I was... I was just about to say, um, I was I was about to orientate us in the sky here, but they've done it for us. Because what we were saying at the beginning is Geminids and all meteor showers, they all appear to come from the same point in the sky, the radiant. And your photo showed that beautifully, your composite photo. So those were two um, Geminids. 
our other in our other shot, the big one. So what we've got here, I can just see at the top of this screen, that is the Orion Nebula. So we've got the constellation of Orion. So that smudgy patch that viewers can see right at the top of the screen is the great Orion Nebula. It looks absolutely fabulous through uh, SLU's telescopes. And as you say, we've got Sirius there, the bright star. And that means that uh, the constellation of Gemini is off up to the right, isn't it? Um, yep. Of it's, it's kind of, when you're looking up at the sky, you see Orion, it's to, above and to the left of Orion, probably by about the same distance as Orion, would you say? Uh, the mm -hmm. same size, mm -hmm. would you agree with that? Yeah, it's about, it's, uh, it's a, yeah, it's maybe a little, well, I, I, they're about the same size because they're both about 25, 30 degrees in, uh, in dimension. Right, okay, so, um, so let's keep our eyes peeled on this. So this is still from La Palma. Um, Come on, I want to see. I want. I want to see another. <laughs> I, want to see a, I want to see another meteor, please. So uh, I know okay, some so of these things. It's just like uh, it, it, it never gets old because every time you see one of these, it's just an incredible thing. I mean, think about it. What we just saw a minute ago is just one of these little. Uh, this was a, a particle from space. This is mm. from outside of the Earth. This is from uh, the you know, sort of beyond the solar. It's the solar system. A little oh, bit beyond, little and this is a part of the the universe that just arrived on Earth permanently, and it just that, that just that fact alone is just constantly amazing to me. And that little speck we've already said comes off this asteroid thirty two hundred Python, and where does it come from? I mean, this is as old that little speck that just vaporized in our atmosphere mm -hmm. is as old as our solar system, isn't it, Mike? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, this is so where, a, does, where does where does the asteroid come from? Well, so when you think about the, uh, this is just such a, <laughs> we have got to be careful, Paul, because we're going to go off on so many different tangents. Got to open up the <laughs> but so when you think about the solar system uh, forming uh, from the you know, protoplanetary disk, when they have the sun and the, and the planets and the whole thing collapse into this a planar set of uh, masses that are rotating in, in orbit around the around the sun. Back in the day, people sort of thought that was a the the unit that was the 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 system, the solar system, and then it was embedded in all of the rest of space. And you know, once the Hubble Space Telescope went up, and uh, people started realizing that there are, you know, this is the story of this. <laughs> we're about to go down the story of uh, Pluto and stuff. But the 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 point of it is that there's a there's a, a sort of an outer disk of material called the Kuiper Belt. And then that's embedded within this giant Oort cloud of material. And it's one of the things that has been so fascinating in recent decades is the discovery of all these objects in the Kuiper Belt and in the, the Oort cloud. So the uh, Phaethon is, uh, is a Kuiper Belt um, asteroid and it's, it, it has a fairly short period and actually quite a short period. And there's a lot of different, um, you know, comets and asteroids that are like that. and you know, it's as as you mentioned. This is a, a potentially hazardous object uh, in the sense that it's uh, it's it's its path clearly intersects Earth, and so you can imagine if you ran the tape, there'd be some point in the future when Earth and Phaethon are at the same place at the same time. But fortunately for us, uh, it's not, and so we happen to be passing through its uh, debris field when it's conveniently somewhere else. So that's a good thing for us. But um, yeah, it's a really interesting thing when you start thinking about the ways that what we see in the night sky are all connected through these uh, different mechanisms that actually make sense when you understand them. And it's, you know, when I was a kid growing up, I saw shooting stars and I thought, OK, that's kind of odd that a star would shoot as it shot through the atmosphere. But then you realize it's not a star. It's a little piece of dust from an asteroid that's from the Kuiper belt. And it all just goes together magnificently. So what a beautiful image of this. You can see. Uh, as you say, the stars of uh, Orion, you can see the uh, Great Orion Nebula and some other details in there. So, so many things to see here. Yep, so and by the way, this is a, that meteor that we saw a moment ago. It was quite a, a fortuitous event because the region of the sky we're looking at is not a particularly wide region of the sky. By astronomical standards, it's a very wide yeah. field. But if you're standing and looking at the sky, it's a relatively small fraction of it. So the, the fact that we got that one meteor already through this relatively small fraction is quite good luck. Exactly. And it is why, you know, so so often 
um, when we're meteor watching, you'll use a very wide angle to see as much sky as you can. And that's the same doing it visually, which is why you're kind of sitting there and trying to pick out as much of your peripheral vision as possible and not not get tunnel focused. Uh, I th always think that's uh, the worst thing you can do when you're um, meteor watching is if you if you find yourself focusing on a particular star, um, you know, like one of the ones in Orion's belt there, you know, you're so focused on that that actually you do get literally tunneled vision. So you do miss a lot of meteors either side. But the meteor that we saw, so this is from uh, the island of Tenerife. So this is uh, from the Institute of Astrophysics of the Canary Islands, which is where uh, SLU's flagship observatory is located, where all of our huge telescopes are. Oh, by the way, we've got a gift card out at the moment. So uh, if you know any budding astronomers or people who are just fascinated by uh, space and want to watch live telescope views and uh, maybe buy them a gift card for Christmas. But I, I just want to say to you, Mike, um, the meteor that we saw, it looked very green to me. Mm -hmm. Same. Why, why, why is it green and, and why do we see different meteors with different colors? You know, this is one of those great things about um, science is that it's <laughs> so predictable. So the colors come from the ionized air. And what we're actually seeing when we see the colors is the tube of ionized air molecules that are um, ionized by the kinetic energy of the incoming meteor uh, particles. So you have this tiny grain of sand or this tiny pebble that's coming in with a terrific amount of kinetic energy. And when it reaches the Earth's atmosphere, friction between the incoming pebble or the incoming grain of sand and the air molecules heats everything up. It's just like when you put your hands together and, and rub them together to keep them warm, that movement, that, that convert that friction between the palms of your hands is uh, generates heat. And that heat is the same thing that is, happens when the, uh, uh, when the dust particles come into the Earth's atmosphere. And what happens is that heat becomes so intense, it literally rips the atoms apart. The oxygen uh, the, rips the, um, uh, the molecules and the atoms apart. So you have the, um, you know, the uh, chemical bond between the oxygen, oxygen gas molecules in the atmosphere and the chemical bond between the nitrogen and nitrogen bond, uh, atoms. And when those are ripped apart, uh, sometimes the, um, uh, the electrons within the atoms are excited and uh, can go up to higher states and come down to lower states and give off these characteristic greenish, purplish colors that are associated with the oxygen and the Earth's atmosphere and the nitrogen. And it's, those, uh, it's that chemical origin of the gas molecules that really gives the colors that you see of the meteors. There may be a small contribution to the, from, to the colors from the meteor particle itself, but primarily it's the ionized gas that you're um, actually uh, seeing that's, that's giving that color. Interestingly, it's, so, sorry, Mike. Interestingly, yeah. it's the same mechanism which gives color to so many other objects that we see in the sky telescopes right. every night you know so we've got the orion oh did you see that one it just cut in uh between both of us uh, that was a no. lovely one so that was coming straight <laughs> down from orion uh, which kind ah. of gives us that direction of where um the geminids is but you know so we see the the reds of emission nebula the the, the ones that uh, exactly that same process excited atoms but we also mm. get uh, some blues as well don't we we get reflection nebulae which is just mm -hmm. reflected light off young stars but, but you know you were talking you were saying uh, um talking about green there we also see green oh there's a nice one going straight across the middle of the screen um, <laughs> I totally that was, that too. I've got that was, oh you missed out come on i told you mike <laughs> i told you don't look away just you've got to stay oh, pinned on the screen which is I unfortunate know. for our viewers because it means we're not kind of looking in our cameras we're looking at our monitors so do excuse the uh the kind of <laughs> offset eye line uh, but we we see um some of these colors in comets as well don't we and we, we covered a couple of um comet shows uh with beautiful green comet comas the head of the the comas yes. is that the same process that's going on there exactly the same thing and there's uh you know, there, there, well actually there you also have um there is a, a component from uh carbon carbon and carbon nitrogen bond so there is uh and it, it, due to the nature of the co2 and the um the other uh, uh carbonaceous materials in the comet head but you're right i mean when you look at the for example the aurora borealis and i know that the 
from an astronomical point of view, the aurora borealis is a terrible thing because it's a source of light and it gets in the way. And light uh, from a, yeah. oh, Ooh, okay. that's a good oh, one. one. Definitely. And, and that <laughs> that came, was a that difficult was a, one to miss. It came straight from the uh, the constellation, just like the other one. So from the radio. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, it's it's I don't know. It's incredible but to me. It always seems like it's it's kind of a slow burn as it comes through the. I don't know. If I, did, I didn't see a smoke trail behind that one, but I have a feeling if we look carefully, we might be able to pick that out yeah, you know, after the fact. I didn't. And, you know, what, what we often see is, you know, quite a bright end, don't we? You know, right at the end of the trail. So it starts off slowly um, sure. as it's entering or starts off fainter as it starts to enter the atmosphere and vaporize. But then it gets brighter and brighter and brighter until the thing is totally vaporized. And that quite often happens in quite a little kind of head at the at the end of it. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the Geminid meteors, although, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about these astonishing uh, velocities of, of these little specks, something like 70, nearly 80,000 miles an hour, uh, 35 mm -hmm. kilometers a second. Geminid meteors, when we when we see them, are actually a little bit slower than some of the other meteors that we see. And we don't tend to get huge fireballs. That one that we saw earlier, you know, it looked very big because we are in this zoomed in view. But the, the Geminids are often a, a lot smaller and a lot slower, aren't they, Mike? Yeah, and I think that's just... Um... You know, I, I can't remember if it's, uh, you know, sometimes the Earth is coming into the meteor, into the uh, debris field, and there's a relative uh, velocity component. I can't quite remember which way it is for the uh, Geminids, but certainly there's some, um, I think the Perseids, we're going straight in, so we have a head-on collision where both of us are moving at around 35,000 miles an hour or something like that that adds up to these terrific speeds. Now, actually, that, that's, that's an interesting one, because when people are watching uh, observing uh, the meteor shower from their own backyard. One of the problems when you do look towards the radiant, so if you were to look towards the constellation of Gemini tonight and the two bright stars at market, the twins, Poster and Calyx, um, Pollux and Castor, sorry, um, they, if you look towards there, the meteors that you see in that region are very, very short because they are entering Earth's atmosphere almost directly onto us. The mm -hmm. further away they are, um, the, the, the longer the trains. And we've got, a, we've got a question here, actually, Mike, which uh, you can possibly answer. This is from uh, Sonali uh, Deshmukh as well. What is an Earth grazer? So Ooh, I've, I've heard this expression before, this Earth grazing meteor. What's one of those and what causes it? Great question. So hi, Sonali. A great question. Uh, thanks for asking that. So an Earth grazer is um, uh, a meteor that goes through the very upper parts of the Earth's atmosphere and typically takes place when the radiant of the meteor shower is below the horizon or just below the horizon. So the meteors are kind of coming up and they're just kind of grazing the top of the atmosphere. And because they're at such high altitudes, they tend to have a slower rate of um, incant you know, heating and incandescence. So they last for a very long time. And, you know, they are some of the most uh, spectacular meteors to see yeah. because um, of those facts. They can go almost across the entire sky. They take a very long time. And they happen at the beginning stages of uh, meteor showers when the radiance is below the horizon. Not so likely for tonight with the Geminids because we're, as, as, uh, as you mm -hmm. know, they, um, the, the evening begins with the radiant above the horizon. So the Geminids is not typically characterized by a lot of uh, of uh, Earth grazers, but certainly, for example, the, the Perseids in August, it's a great opportunity to see those because the radiant rises over the course of the evening. That's a great question. I have to say, I have to say the Perseids is, is actually one of my favorite um, showers, and that's because in the UK, you know, I've got cloud tonight. I can't see the uh, the Geminids other than the live feeds here, which is uh, thankfully uh, giving me my, my 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 feast of uh, my feast <laughs> of Geminids for this year. But you know, the the Percy's happen, you know, on you know during the summer when it's you know weather's normally quite good in the UK. It's comfortable. You can go out. You can watch them. You don't get cold. Well. You still have to wrap up a bit more. 
Um, but my best ever, I'm going to ask you, I, I need you to start thinking about your own best meteor shower experience uh, after I tell you mine, Mike. And mine was when I was working at the uh, Canary Islands Observatory installing a new telescope for SLU. And I was on my last night of the observatory uh, working, which is always an absolutely packed night. And I had my head down. I was desperately wanting to look up and, and you know watch the meteor shower. But what kind of brought that whole night alive was people are not allowed, the general public are not allowed at the observatory, but there are some perimeter roads up there, up on the volcano. And it was just thronged with, with people, holiday makers and people who live on the island of Tenerife all came up. And there were hundreds, there were probably thousands of people up there. And even though I had my head down in the dome working hard, um, I knew exactly the size and the moment of a meteor <laughs> because this eruption of sound of whooping of cheers and wow sounds you know just emanated around what is normally the the quietest place on earth at night the only thing you can normally hear is when the telescopes slew when they move from one target to another uh, but what about you mike have you got uh, a meteor shower <laughs> moment that kind of sticks in your mind uh, oh, there was one just on the right-hand side there. That oh, was a, I a think one. I saw that one. Yeah. Yeah. Just up. So it's a you know we all have these uh, these memories of, of great stories, and I'm sure some of the people watching tonight will have their own experiences um, uh, yet to yet, yet to develop, yet to occur. Uh, but for me, it was it, very similar. It was back I think around 2010 uh, during the Perseid meteor shower, and I um, backpacked into. Um, a Thousand Island Lake in the Ansel Adams Wilderness. Uh, it's in the uh, it's up in the High Sierra in California. I spent about a week up there, uh, just by myself. I camped, uh, did a lot of stargazing, just enjoyed nature. You know, backpacking. It's just so many things to enjoy out there. And of course, I timed it. It was a one of the new moon uh, Perseid meteor shower weeks, so that was um, mm -hmm. that was very advantageous. And you know it. When you're in the wilderness, you you don't really see that many other people. I mean, occasionally someone will walk by on the trail or you can see someone moving, but you kind of think you have this whole place to yourself until <laughs> the night of the meteor shower when it was very similar as what you just described. There was, you know, I was just, uh, you know, I set my camera up to do an all-night time lapse and I was just enjoying the evening. Then all of a sudden, every time a meteor would go by, you'd hear the whole, like a ring around this lake, you'd hear the whole place kind of erupt in... <laughs> people you know cheering and like whoa did you see that and i was like wait a minute who are all these people where are they you know coming from these voices from the darkness but it was a very community experience kind of like what you know slew does is like we're all right now gathered around the you know the, the telescopes looking into the night skies sharing this oh there was oh, one. a nice one going straight across the middle yeah right. yeah right. so right. yeah it's i think just the the community aspect of astronomy is just what's especially great because you know you could the universe can seem like a cold empty place but it really isn't when you think of all the people around the world right now oh there's another, another one another look at that Lovely. and we can see that they're all coming from the same direction and that's exactly what people need to watch for um if they're out in their own backyards but mike if they if we were to see a meteor now oh there's another one oh. and another one that was two within oh, a couple geez. of seconds bro. goodness yeah. um so we need to see as much of the sky as possible if, if we can. Um, if we were to see a meteor coming from the top right down to the bottom left, Mike, mm -hmm. is that a Geminid meteor? And if it's not, how do we know? <laughs> well, it would, it would, it's not. That would be what we would call a sporadic uh, meteor. And that it just happen, you know, a couple, three times an hour every night you're outside. There's just, I mean, the mm -hmm. Earth's moving through space and there's another one, I think. Um, and so, uh, like Paul said, I mean, the the console, the, the radiant of uh, the Geminid meteor shower is where the uh, it says looks like O R M La Palma, uh, just above that, out of the field of view. And so, everything going from top left to lower right is going to be a Geminid, especially if it's a long duration uh, meteor, because that's the uh, those are the ones that are coming out of the radiant. But in contrast, if something was coming from the top right to the lower left, that's at 90 degrees. To the, so it's not coming from the, the radiant of the Geminids, and uh, we would just call that a sporadic. And we're very happy to see it. So, um, you know, it's uh, that's one of the great things about being outside under dark skies is that you can 
pretty reliably see um, sporadic meteors, you know, like I say, probably two or three times an hour on pretty much every given night. So this is one of the best meteor showers of the year. Um, one of the things I mentioned at the top of the show, which you, you may not have heard about, is, is the kind of conditions that people should look for. So we yeah. know the Geminids, the, the radiant rises earlier than most other showers, so we can see them. You know, Normally we recommend people don't stay up late to see a meteor shower. We recommend that they get up early in the hours before dawn. There's another one coming through another one, you know, yeah. when the radiant has risen in the sky. But we've got a very special event tomorrow, Mike, which is part of the contributing factor of why tonight's Geminids um, sure. is such a, a good shower. The 2020 Geminids is a great shower because there's something missing in our sky at the moment. What is it? <laughs> That's what's going to be the moon, of course. And so what are the, as you say, tomorrow, uh, the moon, well, right now, even as we speak in this moment, the moon is as very close. It appears to be very close um, in the sky as the, as the sun. So if we were to, and of course the sun is below the horizon. So the moon is also below the horizon because it's very close. Uh, oh, here's another one. Uh, this is a good, this is a good shower. And so uh, mm -hmm. tomorrow though, as in the early morning hours um, and a very particular, well, anywhere on earth really, but the moon is gonna pass uh, essentially, but well, in the path of totality is gonna pass exactly right in front of the sun. And so we're gonna have a total solar eclipse. Mm -hmm. uh, the new moon, oh, there's another <laughs> one. Yeah. <laughs> but it's this is a good to your show. point. I, don't know that. <laughs> I know it's like watching popcorn pop in a minute. It's like they're sort of like firing off. But it's basically the, the best conditions are like this, where every really every you know two or three years when the, we have a new moon, or at least the moon is below the horizon for an appreciable portion of the night, the moonlight doesn't cause the air in the Earth's atmosphere to glow, and because the air is oh, oh there's another one oh, is not glowing, we're able to see the stars. Uh, in their maximum uh, intensity, especially the dimmer stars and the dimmer meteors for that matter. Yeah, yeah, I I exactly. And, you know, this is one of the, the stunning things about the Canary Islands. And just, just a reminder, so this particular feed, we're looking at a slightly smaller area of the sky. We can see the very familiar uh, constellation of Orion there. So we can see Orion's belt kind of going uh, top to bottom just below that. Uh, you've got uh, Orion's sword, which is actually the uh, Orion's nebula. We've got the horsehead nebula. We've got the flame nebula, a whole stack of beautiful, mm -hmm. stunning nebulae that look absolutely fabulous <laughs> through Sue's telescopes. So this is the island of Tenerife. So this is um, a place called Izana. It's uh, one of the uh, oldest uh, European or, or one of the largest European astronomical observatories. Um, and there's a huge amount of competition actually between the two islands. Um, and if you ask a lot of people where the largest optical telescope is in, is in the world, they'll often say, oh, it's Hawaii, or they'll say Chile, the Atacama Desert, or something like that. But actually, uh, the neighboring island of La Palma has the largest optical telescope in the world called the Grand Can. And where SLU's telescopes are here in Tenerife, so this is a camera which is a about a kilometre, half mile away from the SLU domes, which are operating live at this very moment. So SLU members are controlling those. 8,000 feet, Institute of Astrophysics of the Canary Islands. What Tenerife was known for um, were huge solar telescopes. So these are very special telescopes uh, used to observe the sun. And if you have a look at um, the, the SLU webcams and dome cams, you'll actually see these huge white towers on the horizon. Um, and those are the solar telescopes. But of course, SLU has um, our very own solar telescope, which is uh, operates every weekday. And Mike, we've been, uh, I don't know if you've been tracking this recently, but um, mm -hmm. there's been quite a lot of solar um, activity <laughs> over the last couple of weeks. We've seen these enormous um, active regions and a couple of huge solar flares which have yes. caused I think um, some aurora uh, some northern lights visible even down into you know mid latitudes across the USA and elsewhere haven't we well that was the that was the uh, the hope <laughs> for many of us and you're <laughs> oh, right. Really right about the solar activity um, and in fact I was out with my camera uh, all set up shooting when the um, 
uh, when the, the, the stuff from one of the coronal mass ejections hit the Earth, you could actually see the uptick in the uh, solar wind speed. But sadly, for whatever reason, the, the, it was maybe the combination of the Earth's own magnetic field, the, the, the B field, the BZ component in particular, uh, the aurora just didn't happen this time. It was kind of a, a bit of a fizzle. Ooh, so um, that's the nature of aurora hunting, though. So uh, we're going to go out the next time it happens. But you're absolutely right. And in fact, we're just beginning to enter into a, a new uh, phase of sunset of, of solar activity over the next several years. That's actually I've seen a couple of uh, scientific uh, papers published that um, conclude that this could be a particularly good particularly active uh, uh, solar cycle. So uh, pretty excited about that from an aurora. I've read the same thing. It, it, it's interesting. Yeah. The last two weeks, and this is what makes science so fascinating most of the time. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, there was a paper coming out saying, oh, yeah, the next solar cycle, the you know, 11-year cycle, you know, oh, it's not going to be very good. But then a week later, uh, a mm -hmm. new paper comes out, uh, which is suggesting that actually this is going to be a lot more. Oh, look at that one. Oh, did you see that Gemini then did. just coming in <laughs> from the top <laughs> left? Wow. I'm going to get there's, there's yeah. another squirrel. We should call them squirrels from now on because we yeah. are like, um, <laughs> okay, just, oh, and one. there was one down in the bottom right yeah. as well. So, yeah. um, wow, this is, you know, we've done some, and a little one uh, that just came straight down. But if you notice that all pointing back to that place that Mike and I have been talking about, that radiant yeah. in the constellation of uh, Gemini. It's quite easy to spot, isn't it? The constellation of Gemini, Mike. It's, it's you, you don't see much of the constellation, but the two brightest stars, Castor and Pollux, are, are yeah. quite easy to spot, aren't they? They're, they're kind of, as I say, to the left and above um, Orion, just carry on following uh, Orion over. Oh, definitely. And then if you, I mean, it's not hard to imagine when you look at the constellation of Gemini, the twins, that there are two, uh, you know, figures that extend downward from the, from there. And it's also fascinating is, I mean, that's right next to Orion, who's another person. And, um, you know, there's just a lot of, uh, you know, if you think, if you look at the constellations, at least from a Western interpretation, many of them are, you know, people and animals. And, um, you know, it makes a lot of sense, I guess. But yeah, the, 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 the Gemini, the, Gemini <laughs> the constellation is pretty easy to, to find. And, the way I would recommend looking for it, of course, is to find, um, uh, you know, the constellation Orion, and then uh, you can find Sirius, which is down below the, that, and uh, Canis Major. It's an enormously bright star. Then you have Pro which oh, is, I think, what we're seeing on the uh, right-hand side, actually, in, right. this, in this particular view. Yeah, so you've got Sirius there. there, and then Procyon to the left. And then uh, just, oh, in fact, I think you can Another? see Castor and Pollux, can't you? They're straddling the words up there quite quite possible i'd have to check on i think they're further up than that, aren't they oh, a little, little one coming down um so i mean basically if, if we did uh do your bit of photometry uh so, sorry your photographic trickery and mm -hmm. we uh, aligned all of these images with all of the meteors that we're saying it would point directly above um oh, those, those two stars so, uh, yeah, it um, would be a fun project actually to uh, take the feed here because the, the 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 trickery is really to just um, you have to kind of rotate the images uh, to you know to account for the Earth's movement and we've been only watching for a relatively short period of time so that while there has been some movement there's not been an enormous amount of it so um, this no. would be an interesting project to um, to do. So that came down from what looked like a slightly different direction to me. So I think the one that we just saw there that kind of came from the, the top of the, the middle of the top of the screen down. So I think that was what we call a sporadic meteor, um, mm. which are you know, the, the, the normal small flecks of dust and debris that the Earth moves through every night. Th these... Um, these tunnels, uh, these streams of, of debris, Mike, um, they're not very dense at all, are they? You know, and sure. I, I think the, the particles are spread out by vast distances, yet we see this number of meters because, of course, the Earth is speeding through uh, the mm -hmm. solar system at, at, at an enormous speed. So we're covering quite a lot of space tonight, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, it's it's just an incredible thing when you think about because, you know, on Earth, we have our own, you know, sense a, a set, a range of human perception, what we see, what we hear, our 
how fast we move on the freeway and so forth. And, you know, the, the universe has these colossal ranges that are in, almost impossible to comprehend. And, you know, one of the courses I would teach back in the day is called the hidden universe. And it was basically the, 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 the universe that we can't perceive, but yet is out there. And it's, you know, uh, scales of, of, of mass, scales of distance, and scales of energy. And, um, you know, it's so true that the, uh, you know, there's just so much that are sort of beyond what we could perceive, and especially when it comes to these speeds, it's just incomprehensible. And you're talking about, you know, 80,000 miles an hour, 160,000 miles an hour. I mean, it's just, I just, I don't have a way to put that into a, a frame of reference. And it's, it's, that's what's one of the things that is so uh, exciting and challenging about science communication is ways to, to get those points across in a way that people can understand, including ourselves. Exactly. But, you know, to, 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 to have such a tiny speck of material generate, you know, these meteors that look oh yeah so beautiful. So I, I said at the beginning of the show, Mike, um, we were to oh, another one. This is this is possibly one of the best or the most numerous meteor showers we've watched. And, you know, we are looking at a relatively small area of the sky here. So to be able to see so many like this right. is is an absolutely cracking night. But let's take a, a step back so we, we talked about you know the body the asteroid that these um particles come from we've spoken about comets but people get confused don't they between meteors uh meteoroids and meteorites oh, oh now there's a sporadic was... now that, yeah, that in its own right is a is a fabulous sporadic meteor. If you were out tonight, so even if it wasn't the peak of the Geminis and you saw that, it's coming from a totally different direction. So we know it's not a speck of, mm -hmm. of dust from uh, this this asteroid Phaethon. Um, it's just a random bit of dust that's maybe come off a comet or another asteroid millennia, probably millions of years ago. And we just happened to have you know, impacted that as well tonight. So that was a meteor that that we saw mike what are yeah. then let's let's see if people have joined us late what's the difference between a meteor a meteorite and a meteoroid great 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 question i mean this is um this is it brings to mind another great story i'm going to try not to get this uh distracted by but a meteoroid is um the name given to the speck of dust that's in space so in fact yeah. if you think about the debris field left behind uh, by the comets or by the asteroids, you can think of those as meteoroid streams. So in, in my ways, they're kind of like embryonic meteors because they're meteors that haven't hatched yet. When a meteoroid encounters the Earth's atmosphere and the Earth, then it becomes a meteor. And we see it, this, uh, the, you know, the tube of gas we've been talking about. And then if it actually makes it to the ground intact, at least partially intact, then we have a meteorite. And I tell you, these are one of the most incredible things to think about because this is an object from outer space, if you will, yeah. from the universe. And, um, you know, there's this great project um, that I, I learned about recently where there's a uh, – basically the task of the project is to vacuum up a bunch of uh, basically dirt from the rooftops of buildings in uh, downtown Minneapolis near where I live. And then by uh, by going through a period, uh, a process of magnetic separation, and then examination under at high magnification under a scanning electron microscope, uh, the scientists have been able to actually uh, pick out hundreds of what they call micrometeorites that just oh, cascade yes. down. And it's just a fascinating thing to think about this constant yeah. barrage of. Oh, wow. that, that was a gem. That was a good one. A definite Gemini. Yeah. And so, oh, so yeah. Mike, so this this meteoroid that you're talking about, you know, which is, you know, can be a grain of sand, the size of a grain of sand or up to a, a pea or, you know, a pebble is even bigger. So that has been in existence for at least four and a half billion years since the formation of our solar system. The meteor that we just saw <laughs> had a lifespan of uh, a fraction half of a second. Time. A yeah, second, yeah. you know, uh, probably shorter than that, as you say. So how do these objects then become meteorites? How does a meteorite exist? Because everything that we're seeing tonight is burning up in the atmosphere. They're vaporizing the atmosphere. There's nothing left of them. 
So well, that's where do meteorites come from? <laughs> well, they're just big enough to survive. I mean, it's there's nothing special about them other than their their size, how big they are when they start, and um, and as you say, you're right. Very small ones just burn up upon entry, and you know the very the, the dimmer ones that we see are smaller particles. They have um, you know the the kinetic energy, the incoming kinetic energy is a half mv is a half mv squared. So m is the mass. And so the kinetic energy just scales linearly with the mass. The bigger is the object, proportionately bigger is the kinetic energy. And, um, you know, there's some interesting, you know, physics you can do with the, you know, surface to volume ratio in terms of massive objects have a lot of, you know, volume and proportionally smaller surface area. And the point being that the larger is the object, the light more likely it is to make it to the ground intact. And, um, you know, some meteor meteorites can be, you know, the size of a baseball, sometimes can be the size of an elevator, which is bad. Or I, I, don't think, I think an elevator is okay. I can't really remember the threshold between a large boom in the sky and, and a civilization. But, um, you know, they come in all different sizes and flavors. And, of course, one of NASA's uh, objectives for years now has been to map out all the potentially hazardous, you know, asteroids that are out there floating around that might cross the Earth's orbit and the Earth's position within that orbit and uh, you know things look pretty safe for now but that's certainly one of the you know uh, if you think back to the dino killer you know 65 million or so years ago I mean there's it's 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 a it's a hazardous uh, you know environment but fortunately as in, in terms of you know human evolution on Earth's evolution within the solar system and the history of the universe we now live in a time when there aren't that many asteroid collisions with Earth and it's most likely not a coincidence it's just if we had evolved before now, we would have been <laughs> decimated by an impact. And uh, that would have been the end of the story. So um, yay for us in 2020 and, 20 and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike, you're, I wouldn't argue, but uh, a lot of people describe you, as I do, one of the best um, astrophotographers <laughs> in the world. You run the Nightscapes Club um, at SLU. Um, so um, you 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 have your night. Sorry, I was I was distracted there and by another squirrel. I, um, you probably didn't see that squirrel, did you? Or you did? Oh, he didn't. Did I miss one? Oh no, I, I missed small. one as well because I was. Okay. We I should was keep looking a at a message. Okay, there was another one. <laughs> <laughs> how many missed squirrels we get? But you see, you how go. do you know if the other person's kind of saying? You know, if I said, "Oh, did you see that one?" Then you see. Anyway, Mike, oh, you run the night nice <laughs> hey, yeah, No, sorry, you're having me on now. <laughs> you're having, surely you're having me yeah, on there. Um, you run the Nightscapes Club and you yeah. do a, a weekly uh, Nightscape star party. And yeah. so let's go back to your expertise again. Um, you help SLU members with their own DSLR cameras and DSLR cameras are the main thing, I think, to use for, for, for astrophotography. Um, you can get them. I always have this conversation with you, you know, go on eBay and you can find a Whoa, that, that is the best one of the night. Okay, that, that is was, the biggest yeah, okay. squirrel of the night, yeah. for sure. <laughs> wow. wow, what a scorch. And another smaller one down at the bottom. Right, You can pick up. So if anybody is 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 wanting, uh, if, if they've got um, somebody who's interested in photography and um, maybe nightscape, taking photographs of the night sky, what should they buy someone? They're space enthusiast. Um, yeah. For, for Christmas? Well, you know, you can get secondhand DSLR cameras, but what, what should they look for and what kind of lens would they use if they want to do a bit of nightscape photography? Sure. Well, the good news is um, almost anything you can get these days will produce um, great nightscape images, almost including your cell phone. But the key thing, as, as, as Paul mentioned, the main thing is a, a DSLR, digital single lens reflex camera, or a mirrorless camera. Uh, these are now uh, ca capable of producing very um, high quality images. But that's uh, that's really it. The, the key features, the, the, the main thing you have to have is the ability to manually focus the camera because all cameras autofocus don't work at night and you won't be able to focus on the stars and it'll be terribly disappointing. So I don't know if anyone really has point and shoot cameras or these bridge cameras, but many of them lack and a manual focus capability, and that's uh, that. That would be a problem. So, the, but most, mm -hmm. as I say, most uh, 
you know, ent even entry level DSLRs and mirrorless cameras have uh, uh, the ability to set a manual focus capability where you yourself, you know, twist the lens ring to focus the camera or or some other mechanism. So the manual focus is one thing. And the other thing is the ability to manually set the exposure. And by that, I mean yeah. the shutter speed, the ISO, the aperture. Um, and that's really about it. I mean, even a standard kit lens that comes with the camera, you know, 18 to 55 millimeter focal length zoom lens uh, is just fine to get started. You can photograph the moon, you can photograph, photograph Orion. Winter is a great time to get started with this. But you also need some type of a tripod to support your yeah. camera because you're going to have exposures that are 10 or seconds or 20 seconds. And it's just impossible to hold a camera steady. It's impossible to hold. There's another one. There's another one. <laughs> So, so DSLR, tripod, and then also the last thing would be a, a headlight that has a red bulb. There's another one. Is that, does someone just replay that? Because that looked awfully familiar. I think well, that I'm, one I'm was a replay. Yes, I'm being told by the studio that one is a replay. Yes, we've okay. got replay down in the bottom left-hand corner. Thank oh, you, we studio. Go. We did yeah. not notice uh, that uh, that word down there. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, you see, this is, this is us getting tunnel vision. We're looking... For new meteors and we didn't see the uh the word down at the bottom left hand right. side thank you for that studio that's uh, that was good so you know yeah. what kind of cost are you talking about you know because uh, when you buy a dslr camera now you get what's called a kit lens with it as you mentioned um so you basically get everything you need in that package um and as you say the I don't know. I, I doubt whether there are any DSLR cameras for sale at the moment that don't have that ability to set, you know, manual focus and you know the duration. And it's it's good to have a good quality um, screen on the. Whoa! Now that wasn't a replay. What was it? But why is that coming up from the other? That's that, a sporadic. Yeah. That was very coming much, up uh, the other yeah. way. Now if the studio can get us a replay of that, and that another one, one coming down. Yeah, I would love that. to see a replay of of that studio because it looked like we had first of all a Geminid coming in from the right. left, but a sporadic meteor coming up <laughs> from the bottom. Yeah, I don't think I've That's ever true. seen something like that, Mike. Have you? No, that was that was especially in you know for those viewers watching at home as well. Oh, there was another gem. No. That was a good, very colorful one. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. If you're interested, um, might I suggest that? Uh, well, you know, maybe in the weeks to come, you can uh, Google search for meteors from space. And you actually, some of the astronauts on the International Space Station have captured a photograph of a meteor from above entering the Earth's atmosphere, and it's quite striking. Wow. But yeah, those are so, those are some spectacular. Yeah. So in terms of cost, I would say, you know, realistically, here in the U.S., it would probably be a few hundreds of dollars, uh, really, to get really to get started. Um, and uh, you know, borrowing equipment is a great way to go. And sometimes you can rent equipment if you're going on a, a workshop or, or something like that. But but don't let cost uh, get in the way if you if you, if you can. I mean, it's it's it, the most important thing is to just get outside and observe the the cosmos and appreciate the the three dimensionality of of space and you know some of the the science and the history behind the objects we're seeing. You know, why are some called stars blue? Why are the some stars bigger than others and brighter than others? What are those, what's that fuzzy patch over there on the left in the screen that we're seeing that doesn't look like a star? You know, things like that. And it's just, it's all about asking questions and having curiosity and and not just uh, accepting things for face value. It's like, well, what's that? And why is that, why does that look like that? There must be a reason for it. And it's just, a, it's a, a journey that never, ever ends. It is. And, you know, Mike, you're such a, a great proponent and teacher um, of astrophotography. Um, if somebody has already got a DSLR camera and they've never even thought about taking it out at night because they've never even heard of nightscape photography, um, take the camera, get it outside. On oh, a oh one. one lovely one just cutting in over on the right hand side, lovely Geminid meteor. Um, what are the basic settings they should use? They should have their their lens on quite a wide field view, shouldn't? Oh, we've got a a, a okay. replay coming up, so we we'll keep an eye on that. Oh, look at that coming across, Amazing. beautiful. Um, basic basic settings people should try tonight if they've already got a DSLR camera, they want to point it up towards the sky. And there's the replay again. Oh, <laughs> Every time I see that replay, I kind of jump. I have to. Say. I know, I know. So what what are the basic settings they should look for? All right, so the, there's kind of a golden 
uh, combination of ISO aperture and shutter speed. Uh, for the ISO, I would recommend an ISO of 3200, a shutter speed of 10 seconds or 15 or 10 to 20 seconds. And then the aperture, I would just give it the smallest F number that you have. So uh, as wide open as you can be. So it, it might be an uh, F stop of F4.5, F3.5, F2.8, but just not F8 or F11 or F16. Those are two. Those those aren't uh, favorable for night photography. So I'd go for f 3.5, f you know 4, f 2.8, something like that. And it really depends on where you are. If you're in a, a bright city location, uh, I think I saw no, that was another sporadic. Um, Ooh, if you're in a bright city location, of course, the, those settings I just described are going to give an image that's much too bright. So you might want to reduce the ISO, reduce mm -hmm. the shutter speed. But if you're in a dark location like we are here in La Palma. Then I would say certainly uh, the perfect settings here would be an ISO of 6400 to 12800 with a shutter speed of 10 to 20 seconds and an aperture of f 2.8 or 3.5 somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. And it's it's very dependent if it's very uh, dependent on your particular location and the uh, if the moon's in the sky then of course it's you might want to reduce the ISO but but th that should get you started 3200 ISO f you know 3.5 and a 10 second shutter speed or a 20 second shutter speed. Should That's great. Be. And then of course, you know, um, once once you've kind of got to grips with that and see the results, and it's always best to, to look at the results on your screen inside probably so you don't ruin your dark adaptation when your eyes get used to, uh, to looking at the night sky outside. Um, you can then start with some of the artistry, Mike, which is what you do. So, you know, you, you start you know, this is a beautiful view, isn't it, of the night sky we've got here, but we've got very little context. We can see the edge of one of the telescopes down at the bottom. Um, it's a big ra um, radio telescope there. But you need some context, don't you, when you're doing nightscape photography? You know, in the same way as you compose any photograph. So what, should, where, what would you recommend, you know, a, a budding nightscape photographer do after they've... Uh, to grips with the basics. Oh, buy this book. You. <laughs> <laughs> and that's no, by somebody I, I, totally unrelated to you, is it, Mike? <laughs> yeah, no, there's, um, there's, I've written a couple of books on, on this type of thing, but the key thing really is uh, when Paul talks about, when Paul and I talk about nightscape photography, what we're really talking about is landscape photography done at night. So if you mm -hmm. think of some really interesting foreground object, like, you know, a mountain or, a city skyline perhaps or a lake or the observatory that you can see down here coupled with the night sky what's neat is that gives you kind of a terrestrial framework to appreciate what you're seeing in a sense of scale if you could see a palm tree here for example you have a sense of how big a, a, a palm tree is and you can say okay well that must mean that's what i'm looking at with the the night sky mm -hmm. and you know it's quite a popular um uh, it's, it's quite a popular area, and like you know, if you want to join us in our Nightscapes Club on SLU each Wednesday, uh, Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday evening, Ooh. sometimes when <laughs> that was another good one. Uh, we have a great uh, community of people from all over the world who join us and contribute and participate. It's a very active group on SLU, and we have a great time uh, sharing our passion for astronomy and for photography and where it lies in between. So, um, yeah. You know, it's really just a, it's, it's like anything else. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a journey that just, just keeps on giving. It's practice and learning from others. And I have mm -hmm. to say, I mean, I don't know how long the Nightscapes Club has been running at SLU now. It's over a year, isn't it, Mike, is it? Oh, yeah. We've started about, uh, about a year and a half. Uh, very, about okay, a year, so almost, I think, coming up in two years in June or May. What's been wonderful to watch is, um, groups of SLU members who didn't have a camera but they joined the club because they loved your work they loved looking at you know uh, the work of uh, the photographs of, of other SLU members um, but then a, a couple of them bought their own cameras uh, some of them off eBay you know for a hundred bucks here and there and they got out in their own backyards and they've they've learned from you over that over the course of the, the year and a half. And they are now budding astrophotographers. And what I love about the group is um, everybody posts their own images and is asking for advice because everybody wants to 
improve? And I know that you probably are still learning as well, even though you've been doing this kind of photography for, well, more years than you probably care to admit. <laughs> Most definitely. I mean, it's very much a two-way street. I mean, just this last uh, show, there was someone who had a uh, uh, a device for locating. I'll just I, I, I'll, I'll protect their privacy by not mentioning their name, but okay. it was a great a great device for uh, you know helping guide your camera during uh, deep sky uh, imaging. And we've had some great discussions of you know uh, depths of field and lens choice. And but like you say to me, one of the great things is just the community of people from around the world. I mean, mm. I love traveling and I love seeing I love interacting with people from you know globally. And it's just wonderful, especially this year, to have been able to make the connections with, you know, people like you say in their own backyard. I mean, one of the we're putting together right now our very first annual poster of um, nightscapes from around the world. And, you know, the connection to SLU is, you know, oh, there was another great. Um, I mean, there's just so many interesting objects in the night sky that you can see really only through telescopes like SLUs and. If we were to go and look at the beehive cluster, like over there on the left, and say, okay, well, that's what that looks like through the SLUs telescope, and this is what it looks like in the sky when I view it yeah. with my unaided eye, it really helps, you know, you know, connect the dots between, you know, telescope viewing of deep sky objects. Was that a oh, replay? replay. Oh, replay. That, oh that so there's, good. right, so this is the it. replay of Great that job. section that we wanted. Thank you very much, Studio, yeah. for doing this. Well done. So let's take another look at this, Mike. Let's do that. So there's Geminid. There was another Geminid uh, at the top, and that is a sporadic. Yeah. That is no aberration. That is, I don't think that I've ever film. seen yeah. that. I mean, and they were they were large meteors as well. They were not kind of tiny little meteors, but for them to almost go in opposite directions, what a lovely thing to see. There's one there, one at the top, and there's the sporadic coming yeah, from incredible. the opposite direction. You know, the fact that it's actually like, heading. Yeah. To, in totally the the opposite direction towards the radiant um so that's a that's a special one for sure so uh, it's, it's amazing isn't it because it's like, it's, parallel yeah yeah, yeah. The, I, at first i thought ah oh, it must be a you know some kind of some kind of aberration in the in the telescope but they they're not identical so there's no reflection thing going on or some strange thing they were independent yeah. meters here we are back in tenerife which is probably a a good place for us to start finishing up here mike so this is not the kind of view that slew members watch every night you were talking about our community we have this global community of members all sharing the same sky and all controlling um our telescopes uh, at the Canary Islands Observatory. That's Stu's flagship observatory at the Institute of Astrophysics of the Canary Islands. But we've also got, that shows us great views of the Northern Hemisphere skies. But we also have our Chile Observatory, which is also online right at this very moment, I do believe. Um, I'm not gonna look because I'm gonna miss a, miss a meteor. But we can also see the Southern Hemisphere gems. And Mike, I don't know if you've got this on your phone, but uh, I have a little kind of app thing on my phone that shows me photographs or images that I took a year ago and two nights ago um, up popped. This is what I was doing this time last year. And it was my last night down at our Chile Observatory at the Catholic University uh, Observatory outside of Santiago. Oh, another one there. Look, another they're one. coming thick and fast still. Um, and it was my last night of a three week visit down there where I installed a new telescope, the Chile I remember 2 that. telescope. Yeah, it's a 17 inch telescope. Uh, it's over 400 millimeters in diameter. It's revolutionized what SLU members can do imaging the Southern Hemisphere, hasn't it? Yeah, I know you've, you've been incredible. using a lot I of mean, those absolutely. shots. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like Hubble Space what? Telescope, you know, which is honestly, it's just incredible how uh, the detail and the resolution and the um, dynamic range are just um, spectacular. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an absolutely smashing setup down there. Now, Mike, we've got, uh, while we carry on watching for some last meteors here, we've got some fairly special events coming up here at SLU, which are going to run a lot, lot smoother uh, than uh, the beginning <laughs> of this one did tonight. So apologies to, uh, to, to viewers, but if you've stuck it out this far, you have been rewarded with a whole host of uh, Geminid meteors. But 
tomorrow we're coming back and another one goodness me i think oh, this yeah. is the most number of meters we've seen during a slew meteor shower star party i think it's yeah. absolutely fabulous and it's really indicative if, if people can see this in their own backyards you know they're in for a you know because you'll see far more when you're looking with your own eyes you can see more of the sky than we're looking at here but tomorrow mike we've got to me what is to me the the best celestial event um of the year what are we going to be watching together tomorrow <laughs> well i'm really looking forward to this this is a, a real honor to be part of this one but this is um the total solar eclipse that's going to take place in south america and uh you know i know a couple i know at least one person who is uh, traveling down there to observe it in, in themselves but this is just one of those events that's not to be missed um yeah. and it's just one of those weird coincidences of nature that the you know, as the moon passes directly in front of the sun, they're exactly the same, at least for the middle part of this one, they're exactly the same diameter. And uh, the effects that are produced by that are just phenomenal. You know, just, and I'll leave it at that. But yeah, it's, it's one yep. of those things not to be missed. Um, yep, so uh, that is uh, tomorrow. That's uh, 2.30 p.m. GMT, which is 9.30 a.m. Eastern time. And then... You know, there's a there's a fascinating diagram, actually, Mike, that we're going to show tomorrow um, mm -hmm. about where the path of totality is going, because it's going right over the southern tip of Chile and Argentina, um, which is a very small amount of land mass for. Um, so this is where you can see the, the total solar eclipse from. Um, but you, you see this diagram that we've got and the Earth is really tilted up. And that's because. We're only a few days, a week away, actually, from um, the December solstice. So December solstice is when the, the Earth's southern hemisphere is tilted most towards the sun and another meteor there. So we've got a show coming up. This is going to be a fascinating show. I'm, I hope, I'm hoping you're going to um, commit to coming to this one, uh, to, to at least view it, Mike. It's uh, the still sun celebrating the solstice. And we're celebrating mm -hmm. the moment of solstice because a lot of people think solstice is a day but there's actually a moment oh it's a moment yeah. solstice when the sun is at a standstill in the sky that one starts at 5 30 a.m your time uh or eastern time are you going to be up and around for that one i might be yeah i might have a <laughs> okay. couple of kids in the background but uh <laughs> okay <laughs> we can give so it a try what we're doing there we, we're having a very special show for that one uh we're going to have live views uh, from the Canary Islands uh, SLU solar telescope. Uh, so hopefully we'll see loads of that solar activity oh, that's be been uh, visible at the moment. But we're going to end that one off as well with a special uh, yoga session um, with Caroline Kinsolving, uh, who's a, an actress, Shakespearean actress and yogi. Um, and uh, she's going to take us through a lovely little relaxing yoga session at the uh, at the end of that start That's fantastic. Party, which is gonna be, I, okay uh, yes be really i'll be cool. there for that uh, now, now, okay, now, so, now I'm, I'm in i'm in okay so i i suspect i might get into a position that i might not be able to extricate myself from which is going to be really important because you're then joining us for a show later on uh that day which is at 2 p.m eastern that's 7 p.m gmt and it's the great conjunction now i am really looking forward to this it's historic it's the closest we'll tell people in a minute what a great conjunction is but it's the closest one since i think 1623 they only happen every 20 years so slew's been going for 17 years we've never seen a great conjunction that's fantastic Mike, tell us what a great conjunction is because i know that you've been photographing this already and in fact the slew telescopes have been photographing it every night uh, so what is the great conjunction that we're covering on monday the 21st of december well this is a this is it is truly a historic event and so uh, the planets saturn and jupiter if, if you haven't seen this already appear to be getting very close in the in the night in the early evening sky and this just happens because they're moving in their orbits at different you know speeds and so um and their orbits are in the same plane so it's like two cars that are are lapping each other on a race car track and on that night um and in fact if you can go out tonight you know i've been going out for the last uh, couple of weeks and it's certainly mm -hmm. worth seeing 
Um, but on the night of the uh, of the 21st, on the solstice, coincidentally, they're going to be so close in the night sky, it may be impossible with your unaided eye to differentiate them. And they're just going to be these, this one super bright spot of light. Mm -hmm. And through a telescope, I mean, you know, Saturn and Jupiter are two of the top images to top objects to observe through a telescope yeah. and to have them in a single field of view with the rings and the moons and the bands yeah. and the i mean it's just we, a, we, it's an event that not to be missed yeah we, we saw tonight i mean uh, slew's telescopes have a, a variety of fields of view as mike says and a field of view is is really the amount of sky that that particular telescope can look at oh look no, well done um thank you very much studio so what we've got here is this little diagram of you can see there november 26th they were quite a long way apart in the sky getting closer and closer and closer and what's actually happening is jupiter is catching up with saturn they're both kind of moving in the night sky but jupiter because it's closer to us than saturn its orbit is smaller it's it's catching up with saturn and actually he's going to pass it uh, after the 21st but all of the slew telescopes have different fields of view the amount of sky that we can see and what we're doing at the moment is one of the telescopes, the Canary 3 Deep Sky Telescope, has a very large field of view. And all this week, we're able to see um, both uh, Jupiter and its four Galilean moons spread out on either side. We're seeing Saturn with two of its moons getting closer and closer each evening. Then at the weekend, they come within the field of view of some of our giant telescopes, the half meter telescope, the Canary 2 telescope, and we're going to see them in unprecedented detail wow. there. But, but then on Sunday, Monday and Tuesday, we're going to see them in glorious close up because they come within the small field of view of what we call the Canary 4 solar system telescope. So this, this telescope is designed to capture the planets and small objects like planetary nebulae and stars, just small objects, basically. And the, Jupiter and Saturn are getting so close together that they even fit within this tiny, tiny field of view. And Mike, I think this is kind of perfectly timed, really, for the holiday season, because the, we'll talk about this on the show. Um, but there's there, there are some thoughts that the Star of Bethlehem was thought to be a great conjunction, isn't it? Actually, absolutely. And um, certainly when you see, oh, there was another one. That's that a good a one. <laughs> absolutely. And so um, it'll be great to see this actually take place and to um, just consider all the different implications of the uh, of the positions of the satellites, because it's going to be just a spectacular yeah. event in the sky. And it's the, for those planning to view it, I mean, it's only going to happen just to plan ahead within a few minutes of sunset on the on the 21st. So uh, yeah. it's certainly not an event to go out at, you know, eight or nine o'clock at night and hope to see it because they will have set below the western horizon. So you want to and the, but the good thing about this is they're so bright that you can see them even from when, within most cities. And so yeah. this is not a difficult object to see. You just have to have clear skies right after sunset or within an hour or so yeah. after sunset. Yeah, exactly. And, and even we're going to be limited even on um, our star party length. Uh, we, we've only got them for 30 minutes before they start setting right. below the horizon. But uh, uh, we have also got, by the way, on uh, the great South American total solar eclipse star party tomorrow, uh, Monday, uh, we've got some rather special news um, for you. Um, there's only one total solar eclipse in 2021, which is in December, it's incredibly difficult to see because the path of totality, you have to be down close to Antarctica to see it. Mm -hmm. But tomorrow we've got some uh, details of how anyone can join the SLU total solar eclipse Antarctica expedition, a 20 day polar wow. odyssey down there. All right, yeah, that's the first Mike's heard of that one, you see. It's an absolute <laughs> exclusive. Um, but uh, SLU members can join us uh, on a SLU expedition. We did something similar a few years ago for the transcontinental USA eclipse. Uh, and it was just wonderful. As Mike said, you know, having a community uh, together, you know, having a virtual community is absolutely wonderful. But having that odd occasion when you can all get together in person to witness one of these absolutely extraordinary and, and life-changing for a lot of people, uh, celestial events. It's going to be uh, 
it's going to be a good one. So uh, I'll talk Fantastic. to you about that, uh, Mike. Uh, That's uh, maybe, amazing. Uh, maybe tomorrow, <laughs> but it's going to be an absolutely fabulous trip. Uh, so anyway, Mike, I think we should round up tonight. Have you got anything, uh, anything you'd like to uh, say to viewers before we uh, we round up? No, I mean, it is. I, thanks again for joining us and especially for your patience at the outset. But this is really one of those great events that, uh, you know, we're all in this together. And, um, you know, just uh, if you can share this with somebody who might not have had a chance or, you know, thought to get outside and enjoy it, it's such a rewarding uh, thing. And mm -hmm. it's certainly the sort of thing that sometimes people don't want, don't know what they don't know. And, you know, being that person in someone else's life where you can introduce them to a new a new outlet through SLU or through just going outside yourself and looking. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a lifelong journey and it just never, ever, ever ends. As you can see from tonight, yeah. I mean, Paul and I just touched on a few things that we're going to, I'm sure just continue to carry on discussing, but no, thanks so much for having me on. It's always a pleasure to be a uh, part of these discussions, Paul. And uh, it's, well, um, thank congratulations you. on a wonderful night. Well, thank you very much, Mike. And thank you for, uh, for managing to come on a little bit earlier and, and bailing me out. I was, juggling a little bit there but uh, viewers uh, this is a great test for tomorrow in 14 hours time or thereabouts 9 30 a.m eastern time uh, 14 30 utc that's 2 30 p.m gmt monday the best celestial event of 2020 the great south oh and that's Saw a that. lovely little one to uh, to finish us up on the the great south american total solar eclipse there is no other astronomical spectacle that comes anywhere close to totality when our moon totally obscures uh, the sun. Uh, now, I've got one last little thing to say to you all. Uh, if you have enjoyed this, or you know somebody else who would enjoy this, then don't forget, um, you can join SLU, uh, but you can also hop over to Amazon and you can buy a gift card membership to SLU, and that allows uh, your loved one to control SLU's mighty telescopes. And we don't do many shows, my, many public shows, um, where we show the live views um, from SLU's telescopes. But, you know, you see things like Omegan Centauri, that lovely globular cluster, the Tarantula Nebula in the Chile telescopes, or the Orion Nebula in the Canary Islands telescopes. I mean, they still, after 17 years, the live views of those objects make my jaw drop. So if you have got somebody out there who's either just a budding space in, in, enthusiast, just loves the awe and wonder of looking up at the night sky, then this is a great gift for Christmas. I know that's a bit of a plug, but we want to grow the community because it's an absolutely fabulous place to be um, with lots of things to do, including Dr. Mike Shaw's Nightscape Club, if you want to learn how to do a bit of astrophotography yourself as well. So, uh, Mike, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you very much, everybody at the studio for helping us. Thank you so much to uh, Skylive TV, uh, the Institute of Astrophysics at the Canary Islands, uh, for these wonderful feasts. I mean, I don't think we've ever seen quite as many meteors in a single show, and we have seen some absolute corkers tonight. So thanks to them, and thank you to all of you uh, for watching. We will hopefully see you tomorrow for our total solar eclipse coverage. Good night for now. Good night. Thank you, Paul.